All right. So, um, I, I uh, you know, as is the usual case, I meet with the guest beforehand uh, just to find out what topics they'd like to touch upon. So I'll have a few um, questions to ask her about things that I sort of know the answer to, but she'll elaborate on them. And then we'll get into the heart of the uh, interview where she'd like to talk about her philosophy of life and so on. So it should be good, I hope. Okay, so you were born in LA. I was. Was that in Hollywood or near Hollywood? It I was, don't know California, I'm from the East. It was yeah. Queen of Angels Hospital, and I think that's Hollywood now. It okay. may not have been at the well, time. Well, because I was intrigued that you told me your father was in the movie business. Mm -hmm. So what did he do? He was a cameraman, which is sort of a, when you watch the movie credits, they have all the stars, and then they have the guys that do the dirty work. That was my dad. And as a result of that, uh, you probably met movie stars, did you? No. <laughs> well, there goes that question. Yeah, well, sorry about that. Yeah, I know, I, but I know you met Mickey Rooney. I did, because my father was one of the cameramen on the movie National Velvet. Oh, and that I was with Elizabeth Taylor, wasn't it? It was in Mickey Rooney who is the only star I ever met. And I was taller than he was <laughs> at the time, so. Uh, but uh, I think that was my whole claim to fame, except that I was in one movie, a Tarzan movie. I was in a tower Did you and swing? I waved. Oh, you didn't oh. swing? No, I never said a word, never got a paycheck. Never but you never, did. you also never swang from a tree. No, swang, no. Swung. I, I'm not a good swinger. <laughs> okay. And I guess you didn't meet Elizabeth Taylor then? No, I didn't. I would have. You know, now that you're telling me that Mickey Rooney was so short, I bet he was shorter than she. I th oh, they probably uh, used props. He too. was in a film, I think, too. I mean, they didn't pretend, pretend that he was a love interest or anything. Oh, because she was about 12 at the time. I think so. But you she know, was very talented and very pretty. Gorgeous. Yeah. 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 I recently looked him up on um, Google because I was telling a friend that I was going to interview you and that you had met Ricky Rooney. And I, we all wondered whether he was still living. So all you have to do is Google somebody and they let you know whether he's dead or alive. Well, he's dead. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that. I'm alive. You are alive. <laughs> Thank you. Now, there was um, something else you told me about your father, uh, which I thought might interest this audience. Um, he was interred during World War II for three years. Do you want to explain why? Well, he flew for Germany in World War I. He was born and raised in Germ Germany. And if you'll apologize, uh, forgive my voice, it really isn't all nerves. A lot of it is my injury. And so, I'm sorry, but it, it just you were doing happens that? anyway. Where was I? You were explaining why your father um, was in oh, yes. prison. Yeah. Well, he was considered an enemy of the country. So he was interned with, interred with the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese and the other people that all ended up in Los Angeles in great big wire caged yards. So he was not living with the family at that time? Oh yes, he, I mean, well they took him from the, from the family. family. Yes, quite unceremoniously. And that was for, I think you said three years? Yes. About how old were you at that time? I was, um, more or less. I was about three. I see. I Very think. interesting. And then when he was released, that was even more fascinating to me. Uh, he had a lot of difficulty getting a job. Do you want to explain why? Because he was German. Mm -hmm. And that was not a popular uh, birthplace or homeland to be from. And so he... Um, 
he tried very hard to, to disalign himself from the Germans, but I mean, I was never allowed to say any German words at home, which I really regret, but um, he just did not have anything to do with Germany anymore. And he wrote for the German newspapers, but only those who had a bent against <coughs> Hitler, who he says he went to grade school with at a Gray's Academy, which was apparently, must have some German name, but it was there that my father says he met Hitler and he was kind of a weird kid, no kidding. I mean, we, we just <laughs> knew that all along, I guess. But uh, anyway, that's pretty much my father. So when he got out of this, uh, these internment camps, mm -hmm. uh, he tried to find a job. He had a family mm -hmm. and he had difficulty. Yes. But he landed something with the movies. Yes. His background was in, his education was engineering but he had a love for photography. And where he met my mother was at the Kodak Film Company in New York State. And, uh, and they became um, acquainted, obviously, and then married. And then they drove across the United States making a film travelogue using the first Ansco color film or Kodak or wow. I, I don't know if those are the same company or not but anyway. Was that film uh, ever displayed anywhere or I was it just a family know. film? You don't know. I wish you could lie a little make it more interesting. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish. Give her time. All right. We'll warm up to it. Now I, I heard that your father was a bit of a gambler. Yes. Yeah. What did he gamble on? Horses. And that sort of <clears throat> brought horses into your life. Yes, definitely. So I thought that was, um, you know, uh, an interesting uh, segue to how you got involved with horses. You got your first horse at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Six okay. years old for my birthday. It ran away with me that day, <laughs> and it was sold about two weeks later. <laughs> and uh, after. I ended up in the hospital, and so that was the first leg issue I had, and I had a disease called osteomyelitis, and it's where your bone just disintegrates, and I always thought I should blame the horse for that, but in fact, I, the doctor straightened me out because he had a racehorse. And he said, mm -mm, it wasn't the horse, it was some infection in your bone. And because my father worked for the movie studios, I was one of the first recipients of penicillin, and it cured osteomyelitis. Mm. And that, I'm somewhere in a medical journal, oh. I'm sure. <laughs> Well, that's Hi. good. And you, you kept with your uh, love of horses and owning a horse or, or riding a horse right through college, right? Right through tonight. Oh, right through tonight. Uh -huh. Okay, I didn't know you still rode horses. Well, maybe she's still no, I don't. to lie a little. Oh. <laughs> yes, no. No, I don't get to ride them anymore. But we did have quite a few when we lived in the country. And, uh, and every year about this time, all the babies are out, and that's how I know I'll die, is I'll be driving down the road and see a nice mare and her little baby, and I'll drive right off the road to be with them. Yeah. Did you yeah. consider a horse when you moved to Mirabella? Was that one of your requirements? Oh, no. No, no, I had been broken of that. Somebody, I... There was some mild resistance. Yeah. Well, I, I, since uh, Ken is uh, chiming in there, we ought to say how the two of you met. I thought that was a kind of uh, mm. something that we should talk about. Um, how did you meet? Well, we were both at the University of Oregon, 
Ken was in law school, having just come back from being in the service, and I was a junior, a junior, or I think a junior. Anyway, um, I was trying to put myself through the last year of college by saving as much my junior year as I could, and so um, I took a job, one of many that I had, but this one was sort of significant because I distributed Winston-Salem cigarettes. <laughs> and there are people I know somewhere probably today who are still talking about the funny little girl on the corner handing them free samples, which probably uh, got them hooked. And I feel really badly. Or they're dead, says Ken. Yes. Um, now, you earned $25 a month. I did. And all the cigarettes you could smoke. Absolutely. And, what, <laughs> and I took and what, advantage of that. And you took advantage. Uh, what I remember about Winston, and tell me, Billy, if I'm wrong, wasn't that the one that the English teachers hated because it said, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should? Very bad English. And we had a major revolt about that in the classrooms. And the kids say, but the ad says, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. You know? And they always had the good-looking cowboy. Pardon me? I remember all those free cigarettes that hooked us all. Yeah, the free cigarettes. Well, now you... Okay. So they both were selling cigarettes. I wonder whether you outsold him or you don't remember. No, we, we didn't sell them. We just gave them oh, away. Oh, you gave them out free? Free, uh, yes. Oh, so the $25 a month was just your salary for giving yes. it out? Yes. Okay. So then the successful law graduate uh, went into um, practice his law, and uh, you were still involved with horses, I think, at that time? Yes. Okay. Eventually got a job as a substitute teacher. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that? What did you teach? I taught whatever they needed, <laughs> and uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much, but... Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I had a real advantage in that the principal's wife was a good friend of mine, and so I don't think he dared call another substitute <laughs> because we relied on my substitute teaching income for my horse habit. And ah, I understand. So. See, I am somewhat familiar with substitute teaching because I had done that before I got my advanced degrees, and it's a very, very difficult thing because they call you in in the morning. You have to sort of be half ready because you have to be in school within maybe 25 or 30 minutes, dressed, ready to go. And those days you didn't wear jeans, you know, stockings and a whole mm -hmm. bit. And then you had to be prepared to teach any subject that the teacher was absent. It could be math, mm -hmm. which I barely can add, uh, English, uh, Spanish. I mean, mm. I don't know five words in Spanish, and I can't tell you how many substitute classes I taught in Spanish, because I had, I had a folder, well, this isn't my interview, but I had a folder <laughs> and it had every subject, whatever they called me, I took out a, a lesson. God forbid they called me twice for the same class, it was mm -hmm. the same subject. But I found the most difficult part of that was um, discipline. How did you discipline the kids? That was very hard for a sub, because you don't have a hold over them. You don't, you're not controlling their grades. Well, I just didn't have a lot of issues. And I think it was because I was lucky and got nice kids, and we had a good time. I never tried to be a heavy hitter. And see, I saved that for my son <laughs> when he was at home. But uh, it, was, uh, it was okay. The best class I ever had was a class that we now wouldn't ever even mention the name of, but as teachers, we called it Dumbbell English. And it was the slow kids, and their teacher had a heart attack. And so oh, I got called in long-term, and I did a... Uh, well, long-term is well, a long term, story, yes. Well, yes. yeah, but it was the end yeah. of a semester, uh -huh. so it was, I mean, a whole semester term. And uh, anyway, we did Macbeth, 
And it was really a good experience because they really enjoyed it. And I'm sad to say that the teacher, when she came back, was very upset that I had done that. Why? Well, I don't know exactly, but, but I think that uh, the kids were very pleased with themselves that they had accomplished that uh, unit. And uh, anyway, that was, we never had any discipline in that class <laughs> because they were all taken with what they were doing. Well, that's nice. It's nice to hear that you taught English for a while. I like that. I Completely. can't talk it, but I can uh, teach it, maybe. Although now, there's a lot of that going on. I want to get back to the horses for a minute before we go on to your next occupation, which is real estate. But before we leave the horses, you said that you rent, you could rent a horse. It was yours if you paid for the food and, food and board. Uh, and no one else could ride it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an interesting concept. You rent the horse? Well, it was called sponsoring a horse. Oh. Okay. And you sponsored it by paying its board, which includes their food, and you have the right to ride it exclusi exclusively. And those situations are available almost every stable in the world because horse people tend to collect horses. And so they end up with a whole bunch. Well, you had said you bought a horse that was lame mm -hmm. for $75. Mm -hmm. What did a healthy horse cost? Well, any amount. I mean, approximately. But, well, a good hunter jumper pony like the one I bought was that was lame was probably about $3,500, $4,000. Oh, well, how lame was this one? Very lame. <laughs> um, well, yeah. well, what? So, so was the buyer. Yeah. So, so, so wait a minute. So what, uh, how could you ride it if, if it had problems? Well, it just didn't, you didn't ride it hard. You just rode it to learn how to ride, which is what Brad and his sister learned on, because she couldn't do him much harm because she was lame. Well, so for $75. I, yeah. <laughs> but she got married to a nice thoroughbred stallion and produced a wonderful baby that became Northwest Pony Hunter Champion. And so it went on to fame and fortune, oh. or their fortune, not mine. Well, um, I know you entered real estate. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting profession to talk about a bit. Uh, so how did you get into that? I was horsey, as the descriptor goes. And so I had lots of friends who were horsey as well and wanted I never to heard that expression, horsey. Mm -hmm. I guess Sad, that means a horse lover? Is yes, it? I think so. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, uh, I would connect with some of my friends, and they would say, how did you get your acreage and barn? And I'd say, well, we bought it. And they'd say, where'd you find Anyway, it all went on and on until I said, well, I could help them find a property, which I did. And then somebody called me who owned a real estate office and said, why don't you work for me? And I thought, what a concept. <laughs> I get paid for this. And, and I did, and it worked out well. And, and of course, your clients were all horsey. Oh, yes, or wanting to be. It's my new so. word for the night. OK. okay. Uh, now, what made you give, give that up? Or do you still do that? No. I think I retired in 2001 mm -hmm. because my husband retired and I was darned if he was going to get to go fishing and golfing and I was going to go to work. Mm -hmm. So I just quit mm -hmm. um, <laughs> ceremoniously, and, but it was over and that was a good thing. Now, is that when you started your travel? No, we started that earlier. Earlier. And who took care of the horses when you were traveling? 
whoever we could talk into it. <laughs> it was always a, we tried Brad quite a bit, but he got to a stage where he wasn't much interested in horses and so. We'll give you a translator to defend yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know so little about horses or for that matter dogs, which I try to stay away from here. Uh, but I know if you have a dog or a pet, it's a big responsibility. Yes, if you, yeah. you want to go away even for a weekend, you've got to make arrangements. Well, how do you make arrangements for someone to take your horse? You feed their horses when they go away. Ah, okay. Sort of like babysitting for normal people. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good to know. So much you don't know when you come from New York. I never yeah. met anyone who owned a horse. Okay, so um, now we're going to go into the uh, more uh, delicate part of the discussion because uh, Christy said that she did want to talk a little bit about her uh, cousin, uh, current uh, health situation. So I'll pose the question, can you um, tell our neighbors something about your current situation? Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, I wanted to make it clear that my situation had nothing to do with Parkinson's. It was totally osteoporosis. And I know a lot of people have said, oh, well, it's really a shame that your Parkinson's has gotten to the state it's in or you're in. And, and that's just not the case. Not that I'm fond of Parkinson's, but I do want to make people who are probably early on in the diagnosis to feel comfortable that it isn't going to cause you to be paralyzed. But what happened to me was that my bones, my father and my mother both had osteoporosis. And so I was sort of doomed. Um, but mine apparently was exacerbated by the fact that uh, both my parents had it, so I sort of got a double genetic whammy. And uh, when uh, early on, and that's one reason why I did go away from horses is because I kept breaking things, and that wasn't a good idea. And so, um, what happened to me on, in this last February, this past February, was my spine collapsed on my spinal cord. And it either compressed or cut my spinal cord to cause me to be paral paralyzed and become a paraplegic, which is a nasty word. I don't like it at all. But the fact that my legs don't work kind of makes it sound appropriate. Anyway, uh, that's what happened. And I, uh, I was scheduled to have a battery replacement because a lot of you were here when I had my deep brain stimulation surgery and had my head shaved. And which was not a high point in my career. I didn't feel like it at uh, Mirabella, but it, um, it passed and your hair grew. And so uh, I thought we were all good. And my 10-year battery that was supposed to keep firing and keeping me uh, less, less Parkinsonian, uh, if that's a word, um, it, the battery wore out in less than two years. And so I had to have a battery replacement and it takes a while to get through the insurance and things like that. So um, I was trying to rush the whole thing through so that I would not have any more of this strange tingling I had in my legs. And I was having trouble with my voice at that time, too, and having a shortness of breath. 
And uh, anyway, I finally got approval to have the battery replaced. And I went up to OHSU for the day surgery. And the neurosurgeon who had done the battery or done the deep brain stimulation uh, surgery initially was there and somebody mentioned to him that I couldn't walk, which I felt was um, something that they didn't need to know because for goodness sakes, they could have seen me come in in a wheelchair. And, uh, but somehow he became aware, the surgeon became aware that I wasn't walking. So he sent me down for a mile of gram, I think that is the correct term. And, uh, and it showed <coughs> the injury to my spinal cord. So I ended up in um, OHSU, the hospital, for seven days and uh, was treated by so many doctors. I couldn't even begin to count them. I know one day I had in the morning 11 doctors. And, and I think I became sort of a point of curiosity or, uh, or maybe they just felt obligated to come by and be notched off as another doctor for the day. But uh, anyway, I became aware because of the way these doctors approach my illness or my situation that it wasn't good and I was in fact paralyzed and I was going to stay that way. And uh, so I started to beg, borrow, plead, do everything to get to Rio, which is a well-known rehabilitation hospital or clinic I, in residence clinic at Good Samaritan Hospital. And I did get there, which was a, a big deal for me because I say that their statistics show that one out of 20 people that apply actually get there. And I w it was the most amazing place and I was there for 40 days. And, uh, and that didn't even count as Lent, you know, and I <laughs> thought it should have. But I, uh, I had, uh, it, it sort of, there is the Craig Institute in Colorado and then there's Rio here as being remarkably well-known hospitals and I learned so much. And I learned from the uh, nurses primarily what to do with me and, and then the therapist kind of expounded on that and made it so that I could enthusiastically try and get at least, not better, but, but to, um, to appear to me, I think it was most important to them that I become convinced that I would be able to go on and, uh, um, oh, and I left out the most critical thing in my thinking, and that was this neurosurgeon who will always be known as, in our family as Dr. Ego because that's the way his life was structured, was totally a, to relate to his success. And um, anyway, Dr. Ego came and sat next to me on the bed in the day surgery and said to me, if I were you, I would call hospice and talk to them because you're, basically your days are numbered. And, uh, and my doctor was there 
and then a surgeon, a spinal surgeon, that I had consulted in October about something to do with my back, but not with any concept of what was ahead. And, uh, and so um, the, my doctor and the spinal surgeon both just booed and hissed almost at him because it was such a negative way to respond to a situation that... Well, tell them the other thing, you refused to put the new battery. Oh yeah, that's what really made me mad because I was sure a new battery was going to cure all of my ailments and that, that's why I couldn't walk, was because my battery went dead. And I think at one point, he just about told me to go to Jiffy Lube or someplace like that and get a battery, if I was so insistent that that was going to cure me. But anyway, he was not and is not my favorite person right now. and. Uh, but everybody else at OHSU was outstanding. And, and they just were so, um, so supportive of my overcoming. Not the paralysis, but the thought of the paral paralysis in my mind and what it was going to leave me able to do. And so, um, Anyway, that's a long answer. A, I got to ask you, as a measure of your wonderful sense of humor, would you tell all these nice people the name of the head of orthopedics at OHSU and your name for him, Dr. Ching? Yes, I know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I called him Dr. Ka-Ching because I got a bill from him initially. And, uh, and he was very expensive, but he was very worthwhile at the same time. So anyway, he, uh, when he came up to visit me, uh, this all came down on a Friday, and he came up to visit me on Sunday morning when his family went to church with the assurance that they would pray for him because he was going to go talk to me. And so he was there for about an hour and a half, and he showed me pictures and did all kinds of, of, of things to make me feel that I understood what was going on. And I must have convinced him, although I had a thousand questions after he left, but, but one of the questions I asked him was, how am I paying you, doctor? Because I kept looking at this watch and seeing that an hour and a half had passed. And he said, OHSU paid a ton of money to bring him from Boston to, to Portland, and he didn't need my money. And so it, uh, we've never received a bill. Isn't that nice? and, and he was just so upset with, with the brain surgeon. Dr. Ego. Yes, Dr. Ego. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, um, so I think that's the situation. I have um, a question to uh, pose at this point. Um, you said that one of the uh, goals of the nursing staff um, was to let you be aware of what you still could do. Mm -hmm. As much that you still yes, could and do, the aside from riding a horse, there, which many of us don't do anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you probably can do a lot of things. And I'm just wondering, what have you thought about that you'd like to do from now on? I know one of your talents, which... Uh, shopping. Oh, shopping? <laughs> I wasn't thinking of that one. You, you, do you know the one I was thinking of? Oh, yes, I do. And that's because I took a really good memoir writing class from Sylvia. Well, I think it was the first year I was I don't here. know, but you were very good at it, and your oh. writing was so good, and that's something that I would love to encourage you to do. Have well, you thought of that? 
No, because I'd rather shop right now. <laughs> the, uh, but, but I would like to take that class again, so if you ever report, ever repeat that class, I will be standing tall. Well, I, I will repeat it even if it's just to have you in the class, because oh, I thought you. you were extraordinary then, and I think now you have uh, extraordinary in your talent, in your writing talent. And now you have uh, so much more to add to it with your new experiences. I, I think it'd be a, a rich experience for you. Mm -hmm. So yes, I will do it again. Good. And, and we have some new people here, okay. This is not an ad, okay. No. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, if ahead, I please. could just make one ad that is a blatant ad, but I must tell everybody that all the things I said about when I ran away from the second floor nursing, uh, when, th when I was first getting the tinglys in the legs and I just couldn't walk and, and it was scary and I had an opportunity to go home for the weekend and I did and I didn't come back <laughs> and I did get in a little trouble for that and, um, and I just couldn't do it because it was scary to me. I heard people moaning at night, people yelling for help, and it was scary. And, and I've been there now for two months this time around, and I can't, I don't know if I've changed or the second floor has changed, but those people are absolutely kind and serious about your well-being. And yes, there are a lot of young people who are CNAs there, but they are so dedicated, and they you just don't have a fear, please, of going there, especially if it was something I said, <laughs> because I didn't mean it. I might have at that time, but not anymore. Well, that's that's a nice nice way to um, conclude some of your remarks. Uh, we're going to. Um, bring you on stage again. I'm just stay there uh, for questions. But uh, if Ken would come up for a minute, please. So, so I'm here because a former college professor threw an old guy a bone. I mean, there's really no reason for me to be here because... Oh, I'm the college this, <laughs> this, this is about Christy. And, uh, and, the, and one comment, there's lots of things I could tell you, a lot of wonderful <laughs> anecdotes over 54 years. But about three years ago, because Christy's been in and out of the wheelchair since we've been here, which is gonna be three years in August, and at one point, when she was temporarily in the wheelchair for a period of time, the length of which we didn't really know, Christy said, you know, Ken, I don't know if I can live this way. Well. Uh, here's the will to live, and mm -hmm. she wants to, and she is, and shopping has never been better. <laughs> our, our wonderful cousin Peggy Zenger, wife of my cousin, uh, is a constant companion. Carol Domenico is also a co-conspirator in the whole shopping thing. We did sell our wonderful Audi and buy a, a terrific ramp van so that we can just wheel Christy right into the van and away we go. So that's, you know, those yeah. are all the, the positive things that we're trying to do. But Do you uh, go Christy, with her on the shopping? I'm sorry? Do you go with her mm. on the shopping? I, I get her there. Then, no. then I go, I go hit golf balls or, you know, I do something. <laughs> shopping is not my thing. <laughs> anyway, I was asked to talk about fly fishing, and, and the, <laughs> the interesting thing about fly fishing is this woman whines and complains about all the fishing I do, but yet when it's time for Ken to go to Silver Creek in the Great Sun Valley or go to Montana to fish the big hole, she's right there. And I talked her into two different 18-hour rides on the airplane to go to uh, New Zealand to, which is absolutely, in my opinion, the top of the fly fishing food chain. And uh, so she's been a principal motivator for me. I've been fishing since I was 12. 
fly fishing for probably the last 30 years. Could you tell me what a fly fisherman does? <laughs> 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 oh, you want to know what a fly fisherman does? Yeah, I mean, it's not ordinary fishing, I guess. <laughs> no, there's gear fishing, which is spin, spinning fishing, and then there's fly fishing, which is with entirely different kind of equipment where you're trying to replicate the bugs that the fish eat and they're either surface bugs, which is what we call dry fly fishing, or subsurface bugs, which we call nymph fishing. And, uh, and uh, the techniques are entirely different from each other. The casting is uh, a lot different. And, uh, but, but the bugs are fun to tie, and I do some tying, and I, what I, yeah, just so that you can get a little more example of uh, what these uh -oh. are like, is uh, I had a couple of handouts and you can sort of just kind of glance at these. The first picture is uh, <laughs> a box of flies that I tied, and the second picture is just uh, a fish that I caught <laughs> with, uh, with Paul. With Paul, we we lake fish now. And he's, he usually whips my sorry butt, but this day I whipped him. He didn't even have a bite, as I recall. I want to know why fly fishing uh, is better than the kind that I understand with a reel. That's not called uh, fly fishing. Well, fly fishing, especially dry fly fishing, is really exciting because it's really challenging to put the right fly in the right place. And some of these fish are pretty darn good size. And uh, it's just... It's a serious challenge, and you know, I was talking to somebody today, and they oh, said, what's "Oh, a good size, fishing." The they said, "Oh, I couldn't stand it." No, well, I, I couldn't. No. It's it you you know, it's like everything, anything that we all do. You're either into it or you're not. But I know, it's, but it's it, you don't think it's cruel. I don't no, know you don't eat them. You don't keep them. It's random. Oh, no, 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 it's all catch and release. You catch and release. Oh, yeah, no, I, I used to be a meat fisherman when, when uh, way back in the days before catching fish. What is a meat fisherman? Well, that's a guy that kills the fish and brings them home. I used to catch 10 fish every Saturday uh, and bring them home and feed them to the cat. Because the challenge at that time was a possessory thing. You know, you caught, because the state said you could take 10, you brought 10 home. Now we don't bring anything home ever. And who was the person who was in charge of uh, cleaning the fish, taking off its head? And so Moi. <laughs> okay, I won't. Anyway, to deal anyway, with that it's, <laughs> it, it isn't. It obviously isn't for everybody, but yep. it is for somebody. And uh, and, and christy has been a good sport. To think, go along. Oh yeah. Well, the reward <laughs> when you can catch fish on the flies that you've tied. And you can tie pure junk, and the fish just don't know the difference. But the fish, the fly tire knows the difference. So you know, if it's a beautiful fly, then that makes a difference not to the fish, but to the fly tire. <laughs> anyway, it's a great sport. My lovely wife is very endorsive, even though she makes a lot of sounds, which I think are just justification for more shopping. But, you know. <laughs> I didn't think anyway, you that's knew. All I know about fly fishing. Okay, well, is there anything else you particularly want to say now uh, about how your life may have changed in the last few years? Well, I think the one thing that I'd say, and that I, this is really corny, but I've lived with this woman for 54 years, and it took me 50 plus years to understand the heart and character of her. She is unbelievable and we'll go on as long as we can. Okay. Thank well, maybe you. This is the time for us all to ask questions. Um, you didn't mention your maiden name, your, your dad's oh. German name. Your maiden name, Christy. You Herbert. Maiden name. My maiden name was Schallenbach. My father's name was Herbert Ton von Schallenbach. Oh, von. Oh, and so I mean, if that's not German, <laughs> I don't know what is, so. Okay. Your major in college, you got a degree in, in journalism. journalism. You named your van. Oh, we also want to talk about your new wheelchair, but, okay. My van's name is Van Gogh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very clever. Very That ought to be the end. That really ought to be the end. No, no. I think it's a good name. Is that not 
typical of that person. Yeah, that's marvelous. Okay, we have another question. Christy, is it true that you were the sweetheart of Sigma Chi? <laughs> yes. Were you the there sweetheart of Sigma. Sigma Chi? Yes. Thank you. I understand that uh, the men uh, from the uh, that came here to sing I know. the other night were going to sing to you, oh, but oh, you weren't able right. to be yeah. here. No, I wasn't. And I'm sorry. We were all disappointed. The ones of us that knew about it. Well, oh, I got the rose though, and so that is still. Well, no, it's really gone, but it's oh. it's still in my possession. Oh. In the, in the days of that frivolity of being sweetheart of Sigma Chi. She was also little colonel, dad's day hostess after we got married. Uh, if you think she's a pretty lady now, you should have seen her when she was <laughs> young. Uh, I want to ask you about the <clears throat> new wheelchair that I understand mm. is on order. Everybody's so yes. eager to see it. You want to talk about that a minute? Well, contrary to popular belief, uh, the wheelchair this one has not killed me or anybody else so far, but its days are numbered. This, I found out, it has never worked properly, and it surges. It will go from the, the way its speed is designated is turtle to rabbit here, or here, I guess, and I go from turtle to rabbit in about a half a second without my indicating that. And uh, so uh, I call. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, we have done bad things. Now, what about the new one? That you're well, the new one will be, it's apparently, according to the repairman who came to fix this and made it much worse. Um, <laughs> Really this did. one has been recalled for two months because the control panel surges. Well, no kidding. I mean, I have people now who see me coming into the elevator and they run. who just flatten against the wall. <laughs> and, and, or I've had one guy consistently get out and go someplace else. And <laughs> he decided to walk. And, <laughs> and I don't blame him. I don't think I would go. Now, what about the new one that you have the on The new order? one will be a similar in type, but different brand and different. Uh, it has, for every gear this one has, that one has 10 gears. So I'll be so busy shifting, <laughs> nobody will even have to worry about me. <laughs> and, uh, you would have been in big trouble if it wouldn't have been for your horse riding experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. sub subject to what the professor has to say, you people honor us with your presence. Oh, yeah. We very much appreciate you all coming. Did you get uh, the battery eventually that you wanted to have inserted? Yes, in I chest? did, but it had nothing to do with the walking, as I found out later. But yes, I am now wired and ready to go, so to speak. Yeah, the fact is, when, when she was losing light drive, we were hoping that it was the battery replacement, because the battery, we had a device that we could measure the life of the battery and it was almost dead and we didn't understand until she completely went paraplegic what was happening and what was happening from sometime in January when she twisted her back as the spine collapsed or, and was in the process of killing her leg drive and, uh, and the misery that she went through I just can't tell you and uh, it's it's so great now that she can run into things in a wheelchair and go shopping that even I favor that, so. You don't <laughs> uh, We have a question from Dot Lukens. Uh, how have you kept up your very positive attitude in, in, in light of the problems that you've encountered? Uh, many people would not be able to do that, and she'd like to know some tips. Well, the <laughs> shopping, uh, but the, um, the alternative is not very pleasant, and I just soon not expose either myself or anybody else to that kind of a 
woe is me kind of feeling, even though my husband goes through a certain amount of that on a regular basis from me, but but it uh, it just doesn't benefit me. And when somebody says to me, how are you feeling, and you automatically say, fine, you darn well better work at trying to believe that, because that just goes a long way for making you feel that you're fine. And, and I think if I went up to somebody and said, how are you feeling, and they said, oh, not so much, I think that I would come away feeling badly as well, and I don't want to do that to anybody else either. Well, I think our philosophy is that you either lay down or you go forward, and laying down isn't something that us two Krauts have ever been interested in doing, and a perfect example of that is Christie's insistence that we have our annual trek to Sun Valley to fly fish, she's going to shop, go to galleries, you know, just like nothing ever changed, and that's Christie's level of determination, and it's, it's laudable. It's just marvelous speaking to you both tonight. I think we've all benefited from it. Thank you so much again for coming and sharing.